David Waldman. Here he is. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's May 6th, Monday, May 6th, 2024. Time for another show, another week, another month. We're sort of, kind of, we're at the beginning of the month. We switched over in the middle of last week. And uh, here we go. Plenty of things to cover today. Uh, today is, well, today's nothing. Today's nothing. Uh, unless the Eastern Orthodox have an Easter Monday. Yesterday actually was Eastern Orthodox Easter. So... Happy Easter to those of you, I uh, guess, what, listening in Greece and the eastern provinces. Uh, we uh, constantly make that joke, and uh, now more than a day later, it's uh, several weeks later, but I don't know. We just, uh, we somehow we let that slip off the radar. But uh, look, hopefully all the eggs have been found. It's a real drag when uh, you're using the real eggs and you leave them hidden around the house somewhere, and uh, only uh, 15 of the 20 that you hid actually make it back. You'll smell them in a little bit. Uh, and it looks like Greg Dworkin has been on an Easter egg hunt. It's, he's got 42 notices in my Skype here, 42 separate entries. And sometimes it's, you know, just one-liners or whatever. But 42 separate entries in terms of uh, stories and uh, various things floating along with him on the raft that are coming down the pike. Justice Putnam has let us know that everything is A-OK -okay at headquarters and reminds us that nap time... Starts in Manhattan in just a little bit. It is Monday. They're back in court. The former guy remains on trial. And uh, I don't know, just, uh, yeah, the, the press, I guess, has become inured to his uh, uh, farting and, and dozing in the clouds. They keep remarking on the dozing. Uh, they still won't attribute the farting. I don't really know what that's about, but I guess that's beneath them. But, of course... Uh, plenty of other things continuing on. The uh, campus protests in some places continue because in some other places they've settled their issues with the university administration and packed up their tents and either, well, if not gone home, gone back to the classroom so that they can take care of final exams so that they can pack up and go home. And we'll see whether those encampments are back when it comes time to negotiate any actual divestment style exits from investments in whatever it is they think they're defining by by way of their divestment demands it's going to be an i i assume another round of battles over what constitutes divestment eventually but you know the look What's wrong with a little negotiation over that? Uh, well, nothing wrong with the protests over it either, but, uh, well, you know, this will make, this has the potential to make it all look rather sensible, but we'll see. Other encampments not yet broken up, uh, still a lot of distance between students and administrations, and sometimes that's somebody's fault, and we'll have to figure out who's and point the finger appropriately. Uh, University of Mississippi. Uh, has had its difficulties. You, I think by the end of last week, we had seen an ample demonstration of the old problems that uh, Ole Miss, you know, sort of thought maybe, I think officially they thought they had sort of put behind them, even though it was really just, well, they won't break out into the open all that often. Uh, well, they broke out into the open over the protest there. And... Uh, it only took the weekend to identify some of the worst offenders from among, I guess, what, what the newspapers are politely calling counter-protesters, that they really, they were counter-something, whether they had any, pro, any protest in mind other than, we don't like this thing that's going on, uh, you couldn't tell. But at any rate, some of the, well, we'll say the worst offenders uh, identified over the weekend, some punishment coming down. It's not clear what the university is going to do, but, uh, you know, I, I, just the ball's rolling. People are identified. And a reminder to, uh, they're probably not listening to the show, but uh, I don't know. If you have an acquaintance who's this kind of reactionary, you might remind them pretty much everything is on camera these days and there's very little chance that there won't be somebody who catches you on a cell phone somewhere and gets you in trouble. Uh, you're acting in public all the time. Be aware of that. That's just good thinking for uh, protesters of any kind. 
and is supposed to help keep you civil. I don't know whether that will really work or not, but it's out there. Uh, we got another message from Greg just to make it 43, but who's counting, he has to say on that one. And, uh, well, there's lots, I don't know, what can I tell you? There's lots to catch up on. Let's go dive into uh, what he's got lined up. He's got the trial up first. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we uh, piled up over the weekend that uh, warrants a quick mention before we dive into all of this stuff. No, no, nothing, as far as I can tell. Stayed busy over the weekend and stayed mostly away from, certainly away from the TV news uh, and uh, largely away from the social media news as well. It's just a good break once in a while. And you know, anyway, to no one's surprise, we come back to more or less the same storylines that we left on Friday. So why not? We'll just uh, pick it up and, and head down the river on this enormous raft that Greg has put together. Good morning, Greg. It's a big morning. Well, there's a lot to cover. And we also have the stuff from overseas because uh, right. England had local elections. So I want oh. to do that, too. But, yeah, yeah I want to yeah, start okay. with the trial. Sure. we That's our government uh, in action. All right. We'll our government. You know, America <laughs> Not first. the other one or the Israeli one or the uh, English one. or America India. First. Okay. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the policy on the show. Okay. The thing is that uh, there were some really nice summaries that were done over the weekend as people had a chance to digest what they saw and think about what mm. they saw. And perhaps most importantly, write up what they saw, whether they well, thought about sure. it or, or not. Right. Well, I wrote, then I thought it up, later. Read it. Okay. But so. I don't want to imply that writing it up implies that they thought about it or even that they saw it. Oh, well, I guess that's we've discovered certainly things we've written or or that have been written and we read. Uh, so this doesn't seem grounded in reality at all. Exactly. So, yeah. all right. So, uh, I'm going to start with ABC, ABC News. Oh, okay. Sure. Why not? I mean, that and is also is, the uh, start of the alphabet. Prosecutors move deeper into Trump's orbit as testimony Ooh. in Hush Money trial enters a third week. Huh. Yes. All right. That's actually true because, uh, uh, yeah. you know, they did get a little deeper going with Hope Hicks. Huh. And, uh, the thing is that uh, their summary is, is I found helpful, even though it's rather simplistic, but it's true. All right. So far, That's their job. Members have heard from witnesses, including a tabloid magazine publisher and Trump friend. That would be David Pecker. Yeah. Right. Who we bought the rights guy. to several sordid tales about Trump to prevent them from coming out. And a an Los Angeles lawyer, that would be Keith Davidson, who happened to be a lawyer for both uh, Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. Magically. Who negotiated hush money deals on behalf of Daniels and McDougal. Uh, right. Now, okay. Trump's lawyers have tried to chip away at the prosecution's theory of the case and credibility of some witnesses. That's their job. We'll see how well they do. Exactly. They've raised questions during cross cross examinations about whether Trump was possibly a target of extortion, which is foolish. Mm. Uh, Hope Hicks blew that one away. Forced nope. to arrange payouts to suppress harmful stories and spare his family embarrassment. <laughs> uh, what are you a talking bit about? To that saying she was concerned about Melania, mm. but I'm not sure Trump was. Hmm. Prosecutors maintain the payments were about preserving his political viability as he sought the presidency and every single person who testified so far said, yeah, it was about the campaign. Yeah, well, it's largely the same. A lot of overlap there, but OK, yeah. But that's important because that's how the jury sees it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And speaking of how the jury sees it, um, uh, first, I'm going to give you Andrew Weissman. Oh, well, Certainly, right. he's a yeah. He's going to be convicted. Uh, school of thought. Obviously, you don't know that till you hear from the jury, right? But what he notes in his write up over the weekend, Hope Hicks' testimony paired facts with a motion to connect the dots for the jury. Hmm. Okay, how does she do it? Uh, well, she did it by <laughs> firming Trump and did fact know the hush money payments. Oh, all right. Well, that is That's helpful because it's not clear to me as a non-lawyer, whether or not paying Carrick McDougal is really part of the illegality. Hmm. But the thing that uh, is so important about Stormy Daniels is that uh, Trump paid Michael Cohen money back yeah. 
for the hush money and then lied about what that money was. And that's really the right. core of the illegality part of it. Yeah, I guess it's possible that he may have. I, I don't know how. What he happened paid is David McDougal. Pecker, a friend of Trump, yeah. AMI National Enquirer, did the payout for Karen McDougal. It was a catch and kill story. It's sorted, but not necessarily in and of itself illegal. Hmm. Yeah. But in the case of Stormy Daniels, Pecker had had enough and said, "I don't want to be the bank anymore. I know what's going on here. This oh. is all for the campaign." Oh no! But because he didn't Pecker love that. pulled himself away and said, "I'm not the bank anymore, and yeah. I won't do this." He cannot testify that I had direct knowledge that Trump knew that Michael Cohen was paying off Stormy Daniels and that Trump knew that yeah. his $35,000 multiple checks were not really for a retainer. They were to pay back Michael Cohen because Michael Cohen paid Stormy Daniels to shut up. Okay. He can't say that because he wasn't involved at that point. Right. He can just say the way he used to kill stories about his infidelities was with me. That's why it's so important. That's why the Stormy Daniels part is more important than the Karen McDougal Dougal part, yeah. even though it's all part of the same conspiracy, which I think that the DA has established through David mm. Pecker. But the Stormy Daniels is where it veers into felony. Okay. Hicks' testimony thus confirmed that Trump did, in fact, know the hush money payments. The Hicks broke down in tears after her testimony was icing on the cake for the DA. Oh, because it made clear she took no joy in recounting mm. the incriminating conversation. Whereas I, I would have, I would have taken joy. Here was Hicks yeah. taking her oath with solemnity, mm. filling an apparent hole in the DA's case that Trump knew about the payoff. As David Pecker made clear, Trump knew about the payoff to Karen McDougal. That's key because Trump yeah. thereafter reimbursed Cohen for the hush money payments, personally signing the reimbursement checks. That, of course, they'll be able to put in evidence. Hicks' testimony makes plain Trump did so knowing they're not payments for legal fees. And for that reason, the jury need not decide whether Trump knew of the scheme at the time, as Hicks intimated, or only learned of it after, hmm. as he claimed to Hicks. Hicks knew that Trump was lying to him, and that's what basically she uh, suggested to the jury. Okay. In either scenario, Trump knew of the scheme prior to making the reimbursements. Now... Not that corroboration of Hicks' testimony is needed, but it exists in a particularly damning form. Trump's own admission Ooh, ding. Yes. in a civil case in California brought by Stormy yeah. Daniels. In that lawsuit, huh. civil case, Trump yeah. admitted he reimbursed Michael Cohen for the $130,000 payment to Daniels, which was done in stages. Okay. Uh, Trump's right. admission made with his co-defendant Cohen is, is here, and we have mm -hmm. that. And the California court recognized these statements as admissions. Now, Trump's pleaded not guilty and denied the affairs with McDougal and Daniels, but it's in the record in a earlier civil suit, which I think was around 2018. Hmm. He may not remember 2018. Well, I'm not even sure he remembers yesterday. Right. Uh, Katie Fang points out something that Robin Goodlaw said. Oh, good, good law. And Robert How Ryan go Goodman. On? Yeah. Our good look. Oh, Twitter. okay. Ryan Goodman. Perfect. Yes. He has uh, pictures that you can oh. read, photographs of, of what? case, uh, you know, uh, oh. right. Oh, More right. significantly than that, ladies and gentlemen, said Trump's lawyers, this is a transcript from the beginning of the case. Mm hmm. You're going to learn that this was not a payback. The $35,000 a month was not a payback to Mr. Cohen for the money he gave to Ms. Daniels. Wow. They're claiming it was a legal retainer. Katie Fang is making the point that when the defense lawyers overpromise to the jury something they can't deliver, the jury's going to remember that because oh. it's on the transcript. There's a record, and you better believe the DA is going to bring it up and close it. Yeah, I would. They're going yes. to learn this was sure. not a payback, they said. You're going to, huh? This was not a payback. Just right. like Trump was a family man and it had nothing to do with the campaign. They said that as well. That's in the oh. transcript. Oh. Okay. So so the point is oh. that the DA has actually made a really good case that the uh, defense part of their opening argument is simply untrue. Hmm. That hurts your case. Yes. I would think. Yeah. Usually, I mean, you, know, the, you have to be reminded of it, especially after a long trial like that. But, but you know, they have notes. Remind well, they, the they know it's sorted. That's that sunk happening. in. They yes. know it was for the campaign. That's sunk in. Right. 
there's still some stuff to be proven about uh, exactly the pro- uh, province mm. of the uh, signatures and the uh, false business records. They'll get to that. It's boring, but they have to do that. And then they yes. have to tie it to Trump. But this is uh, something that is going to be admitted for the record. And this is what Andrew Weissman is referring to. Mm-hmm. Thus, in their June 1st, 2018 opposition brief filed in this action, yes, EC, I think that's Essential Consultants. That's uh, oh, right. that's uh, Cohen. Cohen's and the company, defendant, fake who, who in this case is Trump, yes, admitted, let me, let me say that word again, admitted, Admitted that defendant Trump yeah. reimbursed essential consultant for essential consultants one hundred thirty dollar hundred thousand dollar payment to the plaintiff Stormy Daniels, right, which was paid in consideration for plaintiff's promises not to disclose confidential information because under the agreement, David Dennison was the only person who was to receive the benefits of Platon's promises not to disclose. <laughs> David Dennison. Okay. So, but it's all here. Yeah. That he admitted that the defendant reimbursed he admitted, Cohen my God, he admitted. for Cohen's payment to plaintiff. <laughs> so when the uh, defense says, well, we're going to we're going to show you they yeah. can't prove because it's unprovable because oh. they're wrong. We're going to show you that this wasn't really payment for uh, covering up. This was merely uh, mm-hmm. on retainer. Sure. Uh, but he was an employee of. Uh, Trump Incorporated, so he wasn't on retainer. He was getting mm-hmm. a salary. Uh, okay. You don't pay retainer to him. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, you that's know, true. Salaried employees. I guess not. So I, I'm just saying that oh. the the DA has actually put together a really good case. And what we've learned over the last two month, uh, two weeks rather, is that it all hangs together. Everybody's corroborating everybody else. It's a complicated story, and yet when you go to different players in the story, you don't get a Rashomon, well, he said this, but I saw that. They're all mm. telling the same story, which is really interesting. That is, that's kind of an essential, and, uh, you know, if you, what, sometimes we hear about things that we imagine should be immediately brought before a court and tried, and either it takes a very, very long time, or it's never brought to trial, and you say, how come, why did they let this guy go, or how come they did a deal, and it's because it doesn't fall together like this all that often. When yeah. it does, you go to trial. But this is totally falling together. It's totally yeah. gelling. Well, he's you know, he's not a very complicated guy, Trump. He gets himself in a lot of different kinds of troubles, but for the same reason over and over again. So I guess, uh, yeah, we go ahead and do this. And, and that'll make a big difference, as you said, in the closing narrative to the jury there'll be an opportunity for the prosecution to remind you, you know, on the first day of this trial, these guys promised you that they would demonstrate something that would make it possible for you not to convict their client, and they didn't do it. They promised you this was the linchpin. This was the one thing you were going to be able to rest a not guilty verdict on, and it never showed. They didn't meet their burden of proof. I mean, they don't really have well, to. Well, they don't have to prove it, but, but, but they didn't do it. Yeah, but they do have to prove that we're they wrong. They didn't and they said they would, and they didn't do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's like you can you can do what you want with it, but they said they had evidence that would help you decide that he wasn't guilty, and then and when it came time to show it, they didn't show it. Yeah, we showed it. We showed you it. Believe, and, you know, show if you're work. wondering, is it beyond, you know, a reasonable doubt? Well... It might be reasonable for you to have doubts had they delivered on their promise, but they didn't. So it's just not reasonable to doubt us anymore. They just didn't show up when it was time to put doubt in your mind. They forgot because it wasn't real. So anyway, it could be could certainly could go down like that into the, well, the opening is making there. the case. And, and we don't know who uh, at the 930 start today. We don't know who the next witness is going to be. But what we've seen so far, History. I think that's really uh, a nice summary of, of what's happening. Now, Harry Littman, uh, who Littman. is a prosecutor, yeah. former prosecutor, uh, has an interesting take on what the jury's hearing hmm. and how they feel about it. Well, and what he says is the DA's told the tight and basically chronological story with some doubling back to strategically reinforce key points. And right now in the trial, we're between the stormy payout. Hmm. Which yes. Cohen is really going it's to a good name go into. too, Stormy Payout. 
yeah. and the documentation. And that part might feel like an aftermath or follow through to the main narrative, but in fact, it's the core of the crime. There's dun, some dun, prospect dun. that Hope Hicks had knowledge of the checks and other documents, but she didn't. She didn't know. Oh, really? She felt like Trump was lying to her. Well, but she didn't know. She couldn't say to Trump have. told me that he's lying. You know, so the defense to date has forced the D.A. to go through boring hoops to establish the evidentiary bona fides. That's why you have oh, no. people from C-SPAN coming in yeah. and saying, yep, that's actually a C-SPAN thing. I verify it because Trump said that because the defense is challenging everything to make it boring. Yes. Right. How do you know I that was really, know you know, apart. how do how do you know that that law passed? Did you see it delivered to the guy saying, I've heard that from you? Right. See? I'm you not know? kidding. So some, sometimes you have to do that. That's but right. They've, they've done that. Okay. okay. Well, so the evidentiary bona fides of documents and other evidence means we'll need to hear from multiple custodians. So mm. it's going to be boring. Just be prepared. Okay. That's certainly not the point. Hicks' testimony was even more damaging to Trump than people opined. She gave up the key conversation, which clearly the DA had established in discussions with her, and then had her testify. Well, yeah. Trump provided his knowledge that Cohen paid Stormy Daniels. Okay. Why he did it is something for the prosecution to hone in on. That he did it hmm. has been established. Okay. But she essentially testified he lied to her in 2018 when he told her Cohen had done it out of the goodness of his heart. That's where well, everybody laughs come and on. says, Cohen doesn't have a heart. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Were you able to detect that that might be a lie? Gee whiz. Yeah. Which she noted firmly would have been out of character for Cohen. <laughs> and then cried. Other evidence, including Pecker Cohen phone call, where Cohen complains about not getting paid, and especially the Trump tape Cohen got where Trump <laughs> says this will cost us 150000 to make clear, mm -hmm. Trump told Cohen in advance he would pay him back. And that matters. Because technically, right. it's still a crime if Trump reimburses Cohen after the fact and didn't know it at the time. But it's got a lot less jury appeal. And uh, it makes Trump okay. look more like a victim when Co Cohen oh, rushes see. to save him. And a mm -hmm. nice guy, neither of which he is. Like, uh, well, likewise, it's technically still a crime that's true. if Trump didn't have sex with Stormy. But again, it makes Trump look far more sympathetic. For that reason, I anticipate Stormy Daniels hmm. is going to testify. Ah, uh, yes. We did. <laughs> did we take a few liberties with your former president? Right. We did. Yes. Finally, keep your ears tuned to the introduction of an Alan Weisselberg writing which calculates mm -hmm. the $420,000 payment to Cohen, right. which is $130,000 to Stormy. $50,000 for something else, all double to make him look whole for taxes, plus a $60,000 bonus. Yeah. It'll be fight to get that in, but it'll be very important yeah. evidence to show Trump's culpability and knowledge. In general, we're at a point where the basic facts of the scheme and payments are established, but the DA needs to foreclose certain avenues of defense, he's saying, hmm. for Trump to make it look as if he's passive or quasi-victim or nice guy and needs to tie down the facts and circumstances. And so that's what comes next. Oh. So I thought that was a very interesting overview. And I think that, you know, it's probably right. We know what happened. Now we have to prove some of the smaller points, not so much to explain to the jury what happened. Right. But to head off the defense, who's going to say he's a family man. Mm. It was all well, done silly. from Melania. Right. He didn't know Cohen did this until after the fact, and then he felt victimized and felt like he was being extorted, and therefore he really needs to uh, cover all this up because, like, it's embarrassing, but he's the victim. Yeah. It's a thing you can say, and then like, the defense needs to have entered all of this into the record so that in closing they can say, if he didn't know about this, then why did he do that? And if he thought he was being, then why did he tell so and so right. the other? The thing? knowledge glove yeah. doesn't fit. You must yeah. acquit. Right. So okay, yeah, it's all part and parcel of telling that story and then closing off, as they say, avenues of escape for the defendant at closing. Yeah, and, and so to tell again, their story. so the interesting thing for me as a non-lawyer is, I it was difficult for me to understand. Why this is a crime. Now I understand. All right. Yes, these are misdemeanors, but two misdemeanors make a, fel fen a penalty, well, uh, a felony penalty. Anyway. This is uh, two plus two equals four. And four is the felony. 
and misdemeanor one is worth two points and misdemeanor two is worth two points and it adds up to four. So I get that now. I get that the underlying crime hmm. was basically uh, Michael Cohen paying Stormy Daniels and possibly Karen Dougal, McDougal, you might bring in here because it's a conspiracy to not allow New York voters to know what was going on, which yeah, is a misdemeanor. Voters, yeah. Because, you know, this was campaign stuff and it wasn't reported by the campaign, so this is a misdemeanor. And then uh, Trump used the payments to Michael Cohen. Uh, falsifying the records to claim that they were uh, uh, retainers when, in fact, it was direct payment for, for the hush money. That's a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. But that misdemeanor covering up the conspiracy to defraud the voters makes it a felony. Yes. So I get the story. They've explained that now. Yeah. I what they know. have to do is prove it. Uh, oh, beyond okay. a reasonable doubt. They should doubt. go do that. Uh, yeah, and there's uh, nothing reasonable about the type of doubt that uh, the Trump side wants to present in all of this. They don't. I don't know if they really understand the case against him all that well. But there's also well, I think they, they can do. actually say. Weissman also makes the point: these are really skilled lawyers. He's entitled to good representation. He's well, getting he's it. He can't complain it. about the quality of the lawyer. The problem is the client. Yeah. And the client keeps directing the lawyers to don't do that, don't do that, do it my way. I want you to declare I never had sex with that woman. Mm. I want you to declare that I'm innocent and everything I did was always perfect because everything was. And that sort of ties the lawyer's hand so they can't use chicks, uh, tricks like uh, nope. admitting to small things <laughs> so that they yeah. can defend the big things. They can't admit to anything. Yes. Uh, and that uh, makes it difficult to set up some of the stories that they were hoping to use as escape routes later on. Yes. And now they're not available. Now they can't. All right. Well, they're not very... You know, they're not very smart for taking the case, basically. Right, so that's, that's my, tri my non-lawyer trial summary for the first half hour. All right. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. And send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGR in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We spent the two minutes flying to England. And we're here. Hello. Uh, good day. Cheerio. And whatnot. Uh, cheerio yeah. uh, and all that. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> England had got council and yes. mayor elections oh okay so and you have to think of them as yes. you know uh state uh, elections and mm. they're they're local by-elections as i like to call them which I'd like to buy everybody in the united states will explain to you confidently has nothing whatsoever to do with what's going to happen in 2024 even though republicans keep losing in places you wouldn't expect them to oh I see. but I mean, in england here, they're not so shy about it okay uh well yeah it's a uh, also, they know what they're doing better. And, think, and I'll give generally. you a, an idea of that, just a, a little foreshadowing. I'll give you the uh, title of The Spectator. That's a conservative outlet uh, okay. article I'm going to read for you after I give you some of the results. Things look bleak for the Tories. So, you know, they're pretty clear hmm. about what this means. Bleak. But in these council results, we've learned, for example, and, and this is why I always like to follow uh, English elections. Hmm. It's very important to hone in on places like uh, Twee Valley and, of course, uh, crucial West Midlands where <laughs> uh, Wisconsin elections are run, won and lost. Yeah. Um, Goodness. Because what's happened is that if you look at the number of councils, right. Labor has 51 and they picked up eight this election. Mm -hmm. The conservatives have six now and they've lost 10 in this election. Well, and if you're looking at it in the number of councillors, not just the councils, oh. the councillors, Labor has 1,158. And if this feels like a Monty Python skit, they really do read their elections like that. 
1,158, the silly party, uh, <laughs> okay. has a, a, a increase of 186 counselors. Uh-huh. The Lib Dems, 522, the very silly party, uh, with plus 104 compared to what they had. The Conservatives, the unhappy party, <laughs> has a 515. So they now has left less counselor. They now have <laughs> less counselors than Liberal Democrats have. Wow. Oh. Uh, uh, and they've uh, lost 474 counselors in this election. Wow. Everybody else gained, hmm. including this tiny little party, which is a local thing called the Residents Association, who have 48 counselors. Hmm. Uh, they picked up 11. Only the conservatives lost. Everybody else won at their expense. Oh, wow. To give that, you an idea of what's that, going on. Yeah, that... Uh... And basically, Labor now ah, doubles geez. the conservatives in regard to the number of counselors. There's another party just worth mentioning, because uh, I enjoyed this result, birthday called birthday. Reform UK. The Reform Party is Nigel Farage inspired. Oh, oh, oh he didn't not, run. Not actually. It's him. basically a pro Brexit party. Reform. They UK. have zero councils. <laughs> they right. picked up two counselors. All right. The party's been around for a few years, so this isn't their first year. Hmm. But um, the Workers' Party of Britain has more councillors than they do at four. Oh, okay. Just to give you an idea. The well, who? Well, is it Reform has four or the Reform workers? has two? The okay. Workers' Party <laughs> workers of Britain four. has four. Well, all right. And let's just say the work. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. Just say that they're I not mainstream. Okay. I was wondering, did they grow, did they take the name from the old Ross Perot Reform Party? I mean, you know, anybody could use the name know. Reform, but I but just I do curious. know the voters did because Farage them. basically Labor won, the Conservatives lost. Uh, Twe Valley, I think, was the only <laughs> mayor that yeah. kept uh, a conservative, but that's because he was a local personality. Mm. And West Midlands, where the local conservative personality was expected to win lost um, oh and so that's why i was honing in on those two places okay a couple of others that were important but i can't even remember the name of them anymore but uh the point there is and that's why john curtis writes in the spectator things look bleak for the tories as they the results did. gradually float in conservatives like to cherry pick results that appear to present the performance in a better light thereby potentially distracting attention from less convincing performances look we won twee valley we lost you know 25 percent of the vote compared to a couple of years ago but we won hmm. it's like an 86 percent tory area and we won 56 percent of the vote we won you know okay. that kind of thing uh as the results gradually flowed in and those aren't the exact numbers but they're about the exact numbers as the results gradually flowed in and conservatives pursued this strategy with vigor they trumpeted mm-hmm. their successful defense of the tees valley T- me, it's Arrow, a different uh, valley tees valley t-e-e-s that's the one i was talking about oh it's okay not twee, it's well, tees. I like twee something yeah, okay and they, when, Ooh, no, they pointed like, out labor valley. had failed to gain overall control of one of their target councils harlow Unfortunately, the strategy oh. came unstuck on Saturday when the results of the West Midlands mayoralty came in and the party standard bearer, Andy Street, lost by the narrowest of margins. There was, it seems, not much to cherry pick at all. All right. In truth, on average, in the BBC sample of wards where detailed voting figures were collected, conservative support was down by just over 11 points when compared with 2021. In the mayoral contest, the fall was about 10 and a half points. And in the police and crime commissioner elections, which oh. happened on the same day, conservative support was also down on average by 10 and a half points. Vote on what crimes will be committed. Exactly. That's good. So uh, it could have been worse. The fall since 2021, the party support in the national polls is about 19 points. Oh, all right. The well, polls then, yeah. also reveal that the party's now losing more of its 2019 supporters to reform Remember reform? Yeah, barely. That's the Nigel Farage uh, Brexit party. I think of four people. Yes. More of its 2019 supporters are going to reform nationally than to labor. Uh, and the limited number of council huh. wards where a reform candidate did appear on the ba- uh, ballot paper, conservative support fought, fell on average by 19 points. Interesting. And reform themselves averaged 12. And the damage that reform could potentially do to the party in a parliamentary election, was illustrated by the all-important Blackpool South. I knew you were going to say Oh, that. yeah, yeah. The, 
the, the B. In which reforms, 17 percent of the vote was a key reason why the conservatives suffered their third biggest fall in support in post-war by-election history. In hmm. short, if reform had fought these local elections more widely, the picture would have looked even bleaker for the conservatives. So basically, the conservative yes. party is in big, big trouble. Yeah. Now, I mean, Reform UK being a successor Brexit party, that was kind of conservative. I mean, I, they're on the conservative wing. Is that what's happening? Yeah, the far, and people the are, far right wing of the conservative yeah, party. So, but so, they, so some of the conservatives' votes that were lost went even further right. That's interesting, but it, well, to no did. avail I mean, because example, there's five guys. The current conservative party is i i don't know if they're doing it i think they're just proposing but they're proposing to uh take any illegal aliens they get oh boy do they get them and and deport them to rwanda that's because they're all from there no No. none of them are from there oh no because rwanda agrees to take them i don't know why huh I don't fully understand that. I haven't been following all that closely. You know, it looks bizarre on the face of it. It, it is bizarre. Yes. And so people who really think that that's a good idea might vote reform. Maybe. Huh. But but it's a conservative party idea. Yeah. And they reward it by saying, yeah, but some I want their, even more. Their, I think we should report uh, to Mars. proposed it got into trouble for other reasons <laughs> and sort of had to leave. So they haven't fully embraced it. The way that the Reform Party would want them. To, does this sound familiar? This is like uh, MAGA and Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, I guess, our current yeah. Republican Party mm. isn't as MAGA as it needs to be. Yeah, or as I am. And, okay. Or as I am. Or to Rwanda. Which, which is our next set of stories. Yeah. Rwanda, you know, not got a reputation for like happy tolerance of I'm influx saying, of. You know, there's a lot of weird stuff going groups, on there, maybe? but they're. Conservatives are not doing well. Yeah. So well, uh, right. let's take it back from England. It's like shooting your dog. We feel a little bit more on firmer ground, and that's what's going on in the United States. I remember In the those House guys. of Representatives. Yeah. All right. This is from The Hill, and uh, The Hill doesn't have great stories, but it's sort of interesting just because it, it was a, a reminder that we need to talk about this. Five factions that will decide Speaker Johnson's fate. Oh, boy. Okay. Because GOP critics of his are ready to boot him, except they don't have the votes. Yeah, this, those are about five. If, uh, if you yeah. double then their number. And there's GOP number. critics who want him to stay. <laughs> yes. Uh, then there's, there's GOP leadership allies who like him. Mm-hmm. There's even less than the GOP leaders who want to kick him out. Yeah. Uh, then there's Democrats shielding Johnson. And then That's there's Democrats lot, opposing hmm? Johnson. There aren't that many of those. Uh yeah, I mean, well, all Democrats oppose Johnson, but none who are saying it's a, right. really, I mean, we should example, make it our uh, business to get rid of him and AOC cause another and Jamal problem. AOC Jamal Bowman said, I might vote to dump him. We'll see. Yeah. What What will we see? We'll see Hakeem Jeffries telling the uh, minority Democrats what's in their best interest and in counting the votes. Those two things is what we'll make them see. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't. I don't want to vote for him, but I found right, out he's an that we're tonight. He's terrible. But yeah, we I found out that if if six of us change our votes, something could happen, and we blow the whole thing. But if that, you know, yeah, exactly. but if six of us can comfortably walk away, and it's still going to be a huge margin in favor of retaining him, then they'll let us do it. And I will say, yeah, I don't like Mike Johnson. Sure, I'm voting no. That's exactly what. But well, slash voting yes to vacate. Wait and see means. <laughs> yes. And then just because I enjoy Count this them. so much, I came this across this NBC News story, and this is yes. coming up because Marjorie Taylor Greene says, "This is the week I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull the trigger. This is I'm it. I'm going to make it happen." She loves pulling which triggers. Which makes perfect sense because there was a story that she's basically raking in the bucks. Uh, uh, she was actually running short of cash. Oh. And uh, then what happened is that she went on this uh, get rid of Mike uh, Johnson uh, screed, yeah. and then she started raising money again, so she really? liked it. So that's why she's doing it. Okay. I mean, and Trump wasn't able to cut that. Oh, maybe he's just – maybe people figure he's not really sincere in saying he likes Mike Johnson. He's just saying it, and so keep giving money to Marjorie Taylor. Yeah, it's really unclear what's going okay. on there, but it's a thing. All right. She needs money. She lost a lot of money on uh, the Trump – media merger thing yeah probably so you know yeah she bet big on that early on uh before the merger and then it just 
took a nosedive. Right, but that's her personal cash. So I guess she doesn't have that to lean on anymore. So now she has to go and raise money. There's a new outlet called Notus, N-O-T-U-S, not us, Notus. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yes. Who, not the who is it? I don't, it's know, not I don't us. know what they stand for. I don't know why they have that. I'll have to look that up. But yeah. Notus says, Marjorie Taylor Greene was bleeding cash. Then she went after Mike Johnson. She had about $700,000 at the end of 2023 since introducing motion to vacate. She's brought in six figures, mm. according to a source familiar with the campaign. Uh, I mean, One thing is simple. They write the threat is good for fundraising and its use in campaign ads comes as Green works to restock her funds during an election year. So just note that and, and put that in the record. Okay. The one that interested me, though, is a historical piece about Joseph Cannon. Now, most of you have never heard of Joseph Cannon. What you need to know about it is he's got an office building named after him. Yes, the oldest uh, in use still. And, uh, and, and <laughs> that's the one with the uh, storage lockers that got recycled into offices on the fifth floor. Yeah, now. It's old. Uh, he's old. He, he was a pre-World War I speaker. Right. And a relatively powerful one. Yes. And that's because he not only appointed the speaker's committee, at that time, he also appointed the chairs of the other committees. Yes. He was, uh, it was uh, a lot of power centralized in the speakership then. Right. So what struck me and what made me laugh and the reason I brought it up Some is this paragraph is writing him up. They say, Cannon's control was so notoriously ironclad that he was referred to as Czar Cannon. <laughs> in his 1964 book, Mr. Speaker, Four Men Who Shaped the U.S. House of Representatives, biographer Booth Mooney tells of a constituent who asked his representative for a copy of the House rules, and he received a photograph of Cannon in return. <laughs> that's all there is. And that's all there is. And David and I often, gavel. and I'm the one usually saying it on the show, you know, uh, he who has the gavel makes the rules. Yeah. And that was just absolutely true in canon because he had absolute control. Yeah. And uh, keeping in mind, well, uh, when they called him Tsar, there was a Tsar at yeah. the time, <laughs> for real. Uh, he was maybe in a little bit of trouble, and, and maybe he didn't love the nickname so much a little later on. But uh, Well, yeah. he wrote about it. Okay. In his Did own... Uh, biography afterwards and say, yeah, yeah I don't he like said, they Cannon was largely Tsar. popular with his peers and he clashed with Republican progressives. These members mm, introduced mm. foolish or unconstitutional bills, not <laughs> with the slightest hope they would become laws, but simply to cater to a demagogic or ignorant element. What? And then blame him. Cannon oh. said, well, that sounds familiar. This friction came to a head in March, 1910. It started with a bill about the census on St. Patrick's day. In 1910, hmm. Representative Edgar Crumpacker, because they don't name him like they used to, <laughs> uh, Republican yeah. Indiana, took to the House floor to say he had a resolution of privilege related to the census. Hmm. Now, hmm. matters considered privileged have precedence over the legislative business, but the debate hmm. over the census was soon overshadowed when Representative George Norris, Republican Nebraska, one of the leading progressives, rose to speak. Mr. Speaker. I present a resolution made privileged by the Constitution. All right. When directed so by Cannon to present it, Norris read his proposal to reorganize the Rules Committee by expanding its membership and booting the Speaker off of it. Oh, yes. All right. There you John go. John Dalzell, Pennsylvania Republican, immediately cut to say the resolution is not privileged. Cannon chose not to rule immediately, so days of intense debate ensued. Hmm. The galleries in the chamber crowded with spectators. Reporters filled every seat. Speaker Cannon is fighting the battle of his life, observed the Washington Times. If he loses, he's down and out. For those unable to see the proceedings, newspaper across the country followed events closely. The tottering tyrant, make war on Uncle Joe. Speaker Cannon doomed. Mm. Even Howard Taft, who happened to be uh, president at the time, William Howard Taft, was yes. riveted by the press accounts, oh. according to the United Press Wire reports. Eventually, Cannon had to make a decision on whether the resolution from Norris to alter the Rules Committee met the criteria to be privileged, and he said it wasn't. <laughs> okay. The House voted to overrule him, mm. and after more debate, adopted the change to the Rules Committee. But oh, Cannon no. wasn't done. As oh. Norris moved to adjourn, Cannon asked for a moment to speak. The Speaker addressed the chamber, saying he had two options, resign or declare a vacancy in the office of the Speaker. 
mm-hmm. and let this new coalition majority of progressive Republicans and Democrats pick his replacement. But that's off the table because it would be a confession of weakness. And then he put the rebels to the test. He said he welcomed the vote to boot him out of office. A mm-hmm. Democrat followed through, called for such a vote. The insurgents balked. Only nine voted to oust him, and the vote failed 155-192, with eight Mm -hmm. members voting present and 33 not voting. Yeah. So he stayed. Okay. And so that was one of those uh, Hmm. uh, uh, MTG calls for an MTV, and it fails. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Although he did it to himself, knowing it would. Really interesting story. But the best part to me, of course, is uh, in his day, what are the rules? The rules are what I say the rules are. Yeah. That's pretty much it. That's uh, and and he was sort of the ultimate example of it, and uh, and and uh, it's therefore a good example of what happens when even your own party gets fed up with that. They you know they have the opportunity to organize among themselves and say let's let's propose a change to this. And uh, but yeah, that's and that's also where his his. Rain, I guess, as speaker is where that comes from. The idea that the rules committee is the speaker's committee. He was actually on it himself uh, back in those days and picked every single member of it. And, you know, people wanted to have some some say. And, and they noticed that things that they wanted to do were not coming to the floor because the rules committee wasn't giving them the opportunity. Uh, how come we don't have any say in any of this? Right. Cause, so cause so for somebody so. not steeped in all of this, I step back and look at this and say, you know, Reform can happen in the House. It's just that most House members are gutless and won't happen. Yeah. But, well, but it could happen. There's, there's a lot of the they rules stand that say to it can't happen. That's right. You just have to, you know, organize people and get them, convince them to come to your side, which is kind of how you got there in the first place. So, to the extent that you're a candidate in a box and don't really know anything about organizing people for an effort like that, you're not going to be all that effective in the House or, or unless or put they it hand a different you way. For a hundred years, if you tell them go on the record, they wilt. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And uh, yeah, that's that's actually one of the downsides of uh, heavy turnover in the elections and bringing in uh, new representation all the time. You think that's good and it keeps the the House clo- you know close to the people, et cetera. You don't want a long time. Uh, career politicians, they get too comfortable. But it's the career politician. One of the things they get comfortable with is saying, actually, the current system sort of sucks and we really should liberalize it because we've been, each of us, been here for 20 years and we haven't been able to get a damn thing done. But now we know how things work. Let's change them. And then people say, well, instead, let's have term limits and get rid of you. In oh, fact, it's taken me 15 years to persuade my colleague, the good yeah. uh, representative of, uh, you know, the the northern part of my southern state and uh you know right. it's taken me that long and i i can't do that if you just like keep changing every four years right so you know it's one of those uh self-regulating things but uh, i guess enough frustration will produce a uh, a change eventually and uh, a lot of times uh, then also people will run on that reform and uh that was an odd time, and it's difficult to in, understand from our current perspective that this was progressives in the Republican Party. But remember, you know, it, uh, things are different. Back then. Yeah. And this was... Uh, the party positions were reversed. But, this you know, is only it's, 50 it's years after a, the war. It's kind of a funny image for a constituent to write their representative mm-hmm. and say, could you send me a copy of the rules? And when they get back, is <laughs> a picture. Is it. And it's signed, suck on this, Uncle Joe Cannon. <laughs> Plus, it was a big deal to get a photograph in those days. Yeah. So well, it was a very valuable this. It's a uh, set of rules. Or whatever. They, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one, right? A collector's item there. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, a couple of other things I have to okay. go through uh, before the break, just oh, because, yes. you know, they, they're, they're there. They're on the news, in the news, on the news. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Among but uh, Christy Nunn killed her dog. I do know that. I don't yes. know if you know this, but she said, not only am I not sorry about it, if it were up to me, I would have killed Biden's dog, too. That, yes, which and uh, and I, I don't know how she said she was going to do it, but they did say it deserved a similar fate. And I was thinking about, yeah, you're supposed to not talk about shooting members of the president's family. But I understand it's a dog. You think it's different. But eh, I not only killed the no. puppy, I'll kill again. If I'll you kill your puppy. Me. Right. I'll kill your puppy, too. Right. I'm I mean, but this should make me popular and make people vote for me because really I'm not know. sure why. 
don't and know. by the way, uh, if I really uh, were honest about what was going on, I'd probably shoot my uh, <laughs> media advisor <laughs> as Maybe. well because, yeah. uh, like, who let me do this? I don't know. My media advisor I, is I a goat. I can't shoot them. This, that's illegal. I think I'll just fire them. But I yeah. haven't heard that happen either. No. Uh, they've tried, I think, one last-ditch effort. To, and I don't really know why this they was the last ditch her on effort. the shows. But, yeah, it's the, she went on the shows she to just sort Sunday of deny shows. it. Or not deny it, but to say uh, – well, also, she was questioned on a number of other things. Apparently, one of the other claims was, uh, I met Kim Jong-un, and I yes, stared him down. Yes, retracted. Yes, but the uh, funny thing is, she <laughs> did an audio book. Yeah. She can't possibly not have, That's, even if she didn't read her own book, she can't possibly not have known it was in there because she read it. Yeah. See, that's an issue. Because I, I, I think the denial in part was, well, I look, I used a ghostwriter. I'll admit to that. And I just didn't pay a great deal of attention to all of the details. I, you know, I can understand that. You, you did, you're you boring. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't like your life. You have to understand. I don't pay either. attention to what I read and yeah. what I say. Right. That's very honest. But then they were like, read this out loud. <laughs> and she said, all right. Well, that's the part about it. I don't I pay, attention pay attention to what yeah. I say. Right. I slept and, you know, maybe like the president farted a little bit through the middle of that. And uh, yeah, I just, I forgot that I said I met Kim Jong-un. But that, you want to yeah. know the funny thing? Oh, wow. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't even make her the worst yeah. VP contender story of the week. Oh, what else? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, there are like 500 of them. Uh, yeah. Contenders. Uh, uh, Tim who's, Scott who's... and uh, and uh, Doug Burgum. Okay. Yeah, they've been quizzed on what? They were asked, uh, will uh, you accept well, Scott, the election? I expect the election to be fair. Right. And I, and actually, Me I too. sent you the, the minute and 30 tape, which is so worth playing. Oh. Because mm. it's uh, Kristen Welker trying to uh, uh, ask him this question over and over and over again. And it's actually uh, in a, a tweet I sent you, and it says a minute 30 so mm, that you okay, can find I'll look it. For it. And, ah, uh, I will find it. You, uh, you can trust me yeah, I to can complain trust bitterly if I can't find it. <laughs> right. And okay. So it's uh, right underneath campaign updates, RFK Jr. claims. I'm ah, not going to okay. do that one. But the next one I see, is you know. a Biden HQ uh, tweet. They're the ones. A uh, minute the tweet valley. actual it's Scott tweet answers. Valley. Okay. And the setup is Scott says in yeah. answer to a question about the election, I expect the election to be fair and I expect yeah. Donald Trump to be our next president. When asked why, given that he has previously acknowledged Biden won the 2020 election and if the election wasn't stolen, he'd consider joining a ticket with Mr. Trump. Uh. Uh, who this past week left open the possibility of similarly denying the results this November. Okay. Oh, I found it. Here we go. We got it queued. Right. So yeah. you ready? Uh, yeah. You want me to play it? I got a play minute. It. Do I have a minute and 30 before? Yeah, I think so. Let's try. Oh, we got to turn the sound up. Uh, so, all right. Let's, we've gone through the setup. Senator, will you commit to accepting the election results of 2024? Bottom line. Well, at the end of the day, <laughs> the 47th president of the United States will be President Donald Trump. And I'm excited to give back to low inflation, low unemployment. Wait, wait, and Senator, high yes or no? Yes or no? Will you accept the election results of 2024 no matter who wins? That okay. is my statement. But, but is it just yes or no? Will you accept the election results of 2024? I. I look forward to President Trump being the 47th president. Kristen, you could ask him multiple but times. But Senator, just a yes question. or no answer. The day, so the American people, the, the American people will make the decision. But I don't hear you committing for President Trump. That's that clear. I don't hear you committing not, to the election see, here, results. Here's the chill. Will you commit this, to accepting this is, the election this is results? Why so many, this is why so many Americans believe that NBC is an extension of the Democrat Party. Are At you the kidding? End of the day, I said what I said, and I know that the American people, their voices will be heard, and I believe that President Trump will be our next president. It's that simple. But, Senator, as you know, the hallmark of our democracy well. is that both candidates agree to a peaceful transfer of power. So I'm asking you, as a potential VP nominee, still will you accept question, to right? commit to the election results in this election cycle, no matter who wins? Just simply yes or no. I expect... I expect President Trump to win the next election. Listen, I'm I am a candidate you yeah. your hypothetical and I'm reading my script. Wow. I mean, it's really amazing. Although, I, yeah, I, I, it's hard to 
know whether this would have pinned him down anymore because he's not being logical or anything. But I guess if I was hoping he would shift to the, you know, uh, will you accept the results of the election? Well, I expect President Trump to be the 47th president. Well, I understand that's what you expect. But let us say that the votes after they're counted say that, in fact, Joe Biden remains the 46th president of the United States. Will that will you vote in Congress to verify that result if the votes show that that's the case? Because that's what we're really worried about. Yeah. And, and I think Donald Trump will win. So that's yeah, his answer. Right. And so meanwhile, like, to get enough. it in before the break. Yes. Doug Burgum described Mr. Trump's speech at a Republican donor retreat on Saturday in which he mm. compared the Biden administration to Nazis. Sure. Why not? Gestapo, actually. Oh. As, quote, Specific largely Nazis. very upbeat, unquote. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe in Nazis. retrospect, shooting a puppy or threatening to shoot Biden's dog is not so bad. Yeah, I guess so. You could do worse, I suppose. And they uh, did. Yeah. Well, uh, just to prove a point, <laughs> not a, how do I know you could do worse? Watch I want to be in the running. I want to still be in the running. Hold my milk. <laughs> All right. Well, well, hold your milk because, like, uh, you're allowed to drink milk in the yeah. Senate. I'm not going to go into that, but apparently it's a thing. Yeah, it's true. And uh, bean soup for lunch. There's a whole dietary regime for the the Senate. All right. Well, good. You got that one in. And uh, Meanie, meanwhile, Biden here. leads in likely mm -hmm. voter polls from ABC News and NPR Marist. Uh, ABC chose to do the all voters Trump leads, but amongst mm -hmm. registered voters, Biden leads and among likely voters, Biden leads more. Uh, and there you have it. It's a tie race. And so everybody knows Trump's going to win. Oh, yes. Take care. And I'll talk to you on Wednesday. Very good. Well, OK. Uh, they don't really know that, but they're committed to it. I see. Well, I can believe that. And I like the fact that among all voters, Trump wins. Among people who are actually legally allowed to vote, Biden wins. But, you know, we'll see what happens. And those people who are actually going to vote, Biden yes. wins more. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Time for some early deportations of people who have been born and lived here their entire lives and are registered to vote, I guess. Theory. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So... A funny thing happened on our way to the break. Uh, Greg uh, snuck in that last minute joke as I said, time for some da 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 da. And he threw in theory, like time for some game theory at the end. Well, you know, timely, good. That's uh, a good callback to some old internet lore, uh, social media lore, I guess, but, and not even all that old. But what was funny was, as uh, then he's you know going over the joke. You see, uh, time for some game theory. You remember that? And then all of a sudden, I start hearing a phone. You know, his phone is speaking, and it's uh, and we're like, wait, what the hell's going on here? I found this on the internet, and oh my god, it's Siri, who has mistaken the word theory for hey siri and then gone on to look up game theory and had all these suggestions for us to look at on the web and we were trying to figure we figured out obviously pretty quickly that it was siri that had done that but what what in the world made oh my god theory theory was that thank god i have siri cut off here and turned off here because of course as we do the show anytime i would say something was siri serious or seriously it would turn on so theory i hadn't thought of so uh Siri has a lisp, and yes, or at least is able to recognize the speech of those who do. So uh, it's a good theory. Yes, may I help you? Are you searching for something that I can help you with? Uh, all right. Well, I had no idea that that was going to happen. So that was pretty odd and a little unusual. Wasn't expecting that one. Okay, let's see. A few other things to uh, check out. And, uh, oh, you know, here's a good one to enter onto the record. Mighty OCD. Uh, pointing us to the story, uh, well, the, the source for this story, this time reported to Crooks and Liars. I did see this over the weekend, and uh, let's see, uh, this is oh, one of Cliff Schechter's videos, and bringing this up, I, I saw it uh, mentioned on social media, hmm, yeah, maybe on Friday afternoon or something, but I guess Lauren Boebert, one, she's still alive, and in Congress, and I guess still running. And there's just no room for her in the circus anymore. So at any rate, she made her way over to George Washington University campus because she's busy, well, she's allegedly busy in Washington, D.C. And I guess there's no colleges anywhere in her part of Colorado. 
for her to bother there. Anyway, but she decided to make her way over to GW campus because they had a, uh, a, a Gaza war protest encampment going on. And I don't know whether it, I don't know whether it's, is it the preference of the protesters that they be, uh, identified as pro Palestinian protest. I got the sense that they thought that was a little narrow, even though none of them would deny it and they would have no interest in denying it. I, I'm not certain whether they are. And you know, every one of them will have a different preference. That's a whole other story. Is it an anti-war demonstration? Is it a pro-Palestinian? Is it uh, anti-genocide? I, I don't know what they want to label. But you know the protest I'm talking about. It was happening over at GW and she decided... I'm a member of Congress. I'm stuck here in D.C. There's no colleges for me to go and pester back in my district, and they hate me back there anyway. So while I'm here, I'll make news. Going to the campus, she may have had some other reason to be there for something and uh, and has decided that she was going to, I don't know what, yell at the protesters because, of course, it's very, very bad to have these protests because they're populated by outside agitators. And so I, from Colorado, will go across town to the part of D.C. where I have no business and yell at students from around the country about how bad it is that they are uh, outside agitators. And that will somehow make sense. And apparently she was greeted properly by the students who, among other things, decided to chant Beetlejuice at her, which, by the way, dangerous thing to do. Obviously, it summons Beetlejuice. So, But they were willing to take that risk and remind her that she's just not regarded as a serious figure. You come here to mock us, but we all know what happened in the theater, and it's rather ridiculous. I don't know whether she folded the tent and went home at that point, but anyway, uh, credit to the uh, wise and well-informed students at GW who knew how to take care of business by sending her home. Let's see, is there any uh, written information about this? Cliff Schechter does great videos, but I can't just you know play his whole video in the middle of the show because that's just theft and of course uh it's not like it's difficult to find cliff's videos either he distributes them all across the internet via social media so many of you have likely seen this uh and it doesn't matter anyway there's a bad gateway in between me and them which i assume if i reloaded the gateway would become good again but maybe not no Looks like something's going on. So uh, it's so popular. So many people want to go and hear the students chant Beetlejuice at her, and I can't blame them that we can't get through at the moment. But uh, if you're having difficulty imagining it, um, well, what the hell would I do to make it any easier? They're chanting Beetlejuice. You can probably figure that out in your head. And it's it's young people yelling at a uh, middle-aged lady about uh, her antics there. All right. I think it's sufficiently recreated. I've really painted a picture for you there, haven't I? All right. Let's see. There's many other things to get to, and uh, many of them I have stored already for our discussion. The Gaza situation continues to be awful, and the protest situation here, well, actually, I would say improved a little bit over the last couple of days. As I mentioned, a lot of settlements between universities and their students. Um a lot of, let's say, restoration of at least some semblance of order, even in UCLA, where uh, out uh, they are, again, outside agitators, I would say, and I think everybody kind of agrees that they're outside agitators, came to the counter-protest to make trouble, be violent, and disrupt things, and generally give the whole exercise a bad name, or at least the whole counter-protest exercise a bad name, and... Uh, Apparently, a I didn't put this aside, but maybe we can go and find this via Blue Sky. Um, that over the weekend, the uh, Hillel organization at um, at at UCLA put out. Uh, where can I get to all of this and search this out? Um, put out a statement basically asking for uh, both outside agitators and uh, members of the Jewish community inside UCLA to please just, let's not be doing this. You're actually making it worse. 
and making things worse for everybody. And uh, a, f- a fairly reasonable statement, which was interesting for a number of reasons. But let me find the if I can find this statement that was put out the other night. Yeah, here we go. So this being circulated by, well, let's see. I saw it from uh, Deepa Sundaram, a probably pro- a professor. I don't know whether she's a professor at UCLA or not. I don't know if it actually says in her profile. But PhD is in her profile, and so I'm guessing she's, uh, well, if not a professor, certainly qualified to be one somewhere, wherever that may be, P- putting out uh, interesting statement, she says, from the UCLA Hillel. And I don't know, does everybody, is everybody actually aware of what the Hillel organization is? There's a whole, you could probably do a good, well, maybe a half a show on Hillel and its evolution over the years, but... This is real interesting, um, mostly, and I think this really kind of has to be a preface to this statement just so that we understand where it's coming from, but uh, the Hillel organization is, at its most basic, is essentially just sort of a Jewish presence, an organization that's, uh, you know, national and I guess international as well, Um but but just to establish a Jewish presence on campus, and for most students, both present and past, uh, the Hillel organization has basically fulfilled this role. It's not necessarily, it's not an overtly, well, it's overtly Jewish, obviously, but I mean, it's not primarily uh a crusading organization. I mean, you know, as the evangelical Christian organizations on campus very often are, in fact, evangelical and are about, you know, recruiting people to their movement and making sure that people are, you know, they have Bible studies, et cetera. Hillel, I mean, they hold religious services, but they're essentially a place uh, established so that Jewish students, when they go off to college, very often they'll be going off to college where there's no strong Jewish presence and not a very heavy Jewish presence on campus. Jews are a relative minority. In some places, they're better represented than others. And the idea is, look, uh, if you come to campus and you decide that, uh, hey, I miss going to Shabbat services on Friday, which is a relative rarity among students of any kind, but, uh, yeah, most often uh, kids arrive at campus saying, I'm kind of happy that if in my family there was a strong tradition of attending Shabbat services, very often they say, I'm glad not to be able to uh, or, or glad not to have to attend all the time and they'll happily ignore it. But if they want to go and Hanukkah rolls around and they're away from home for Hanukkah for the first time, even though they're probably, you know, on their way back already or have uh, the rest of the month off but sometimes you're away from home during Hanukkah if it falls early and uh, hey I do miss having and I can go to Hillel and pick up they'll give me a menorah and some candles or we can go to a candle lighting there or if I feel like it there is a Shabbat service or at least a Shabbat dinner for Friday night or a Purim party or a Passover there's a Seder I just on days when you feel like oh yes it's actually a big time holiday or something that we had a tradition of celebrating I'll go and you can uh, go ahead and do that and uh, Hillel exists for the purpose of giving you a place to go on campus you know you can't go too far afield as a student very often and that's it now, there's a deeper mission, certainly, just like with any religious organization. You know, uh, the church, the Catholic church exists. But they're quite happy if you just show up for Ash Wednesday and, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, you won't be there for Christmas as a student because you'll probably be home, but whatever. And you go and you take care of some of these uh, religious obligations from time to time. And it doesn't matter that you, you know, each day come and profess you know, some tenet of faith and that you practice all time. It's just sort of a casual drop in thing for them too. And that's the way Hillel, uh, that's the place that Hillel occupies in the minds of most Jewish students past and present. But as it happens over the last, well, I don't know. Well, really over the, over the, the length of, um, 
Just like uh, there's been the evolution in politics in Israel drifting to the right and Netanyahu has drifted further and further to the right in order to remain in power. Uh, a lot of that is manipulation of what does, well, wait, what does Zionism mean and what does it aim to achieve? And just as things in the United States in the Jewish community and formal Jewish organizations uh, and Anti-Defamation League and Hillel and uh, various other organizations, APAC, etc., there's been a heavier and heavier emphasis on the Zionism part of a Jewish uh, identity and connection to Israel and the picture of what Zionism is has changed to the in the sense that uh, they have very overtly moved it towards not just th the existence of an Israel, but the existence and expansion of a very particular type of Israel and footprint of Israel, which is different from traditional Zionism, which itself is in subject is subject to interpretation. But it's so it's taken on uh, as part of its definition, Hillel, more modern and and not great zionist content to its you know mission and its uh, presence on the web etc but for most people you know it, like any religious doctrine or religious associated doctrine because that's not exactly what zionism is either but there is a religious component to it and some people have put a greater it, it's difficult you know you kind of got to be steeped in culture to understand it and to have seen the changes as well. But suffice to say that for the average student and really the vast majority of students and maybe even all students, and it's perhaps the professional leadership of Hillel at the, you know, at corporate, you know, the national headquarters of that has noticed and driven these changes. And for everybody else, it's like, yeah, that's where you go. If you want to have latkes at, uh, at Hanukkah, they've got some. And you need candles, you can go there. You need to get matzah, you can go there. That's it. And that's the extent of their devotion to Hillel. Or occasionally, uh, if they want, if, if students want to travel overseas, Hillel has been, then this is where it becomes, I guess, controversial with the protesters. Hillel has been a conduit through which uh, uh, the coffers of the organization and and big donors money has been used to pay for trips to Israel what they call birthright trips to Israel every Jewish American or every Jew everywhere I guess is in theory entitled under this policy and the the, the fund paid for with donations uh, over the many many years decades uh, anybody any student that in other words if any student who wants to make a trip to Israel, and that's imbued with a religious significance, uh, but anyone who would want to make a visit to Israel, no one should be denied their opportunity to visit Israel for lack of funds. They will make it possible for you to go and on a bit of a student budget, but to go and to have a stay there and a tour, etc. And there's an agenda attached to it, no doubt about it, but... Yeah, generally speaking, it too was viewed as the stu by the students who took those trips as a chance to get to a place which is of some importance to you, but is expensive and difficult to get to. But to have it more or less handed to you and say, great, I now have a travel experience. And like all travel experiences, it connects me to the place I have visited. And that's the point. I mean... There might be some special significance to it, sure, but also, you know, it's not like, well, look, Jewish students who visit Belgium come away with a special feeling about Belgium because they've been there. That's just the point of travel in general. Uh, but in today's environment, and especially uh, at a time where uh, tensions are high, and there's a renewed focus, particularly by the protesters, on everything that could be said to support the state of Israel, which is now prosecuting this war in horrific fashion. Uh, well, cut off all sources and all comers and all funding and all uh, alignments. And so in many cases, and maybe not all, I don't know, but where they're putting out 
lists of written demands, very often the protesters are including in their demands, uh, when they say divestment from Israel, and this is where we'll start to have fights, I think, uh, continuing later, and fights only in the you know, metaphorical sense. I, I think they'll be settled with words and words only. But uh, that's where we'll have continued struggles over what does divestment mean? Because to some protesters, that surely means, well, actual like divestment from stock holdings and investment holdings that inure to the benefit uh, financial benefit of the state of Israel, which then, you know, I don't know whether that's uh, direct funding or just makes uh, fungible funding available for the war effort. Uh, this is essentially they want some sort of, well, like they say, boycott and divestment of all things having to do with Israel. But this now extends to you also should boot Hillel off campus because they are explicitly Zionist, but again, it's not clear to what extent and in what form they are uh, explicitly Zionist, although I'm sure they're making it clearer with written statements on their website these days. But again, there's a big fight still as between protesters and the Jewish community about what is Zionism, what isn't Zionism, and is it a fair as a blanket term to, well, to say things like all Zionists don't deserve to live. Well, that's always going to be a rough prospect. Somebody or some type of person doesn't deserve to live, but then you're going to have difficulty explaining what is that type of person. Uh, but similarly, they are saying essentially uh, there should be no place on our university campus for any organization that will be willing to say explicitly that they are Zionist because our definition of Zionism is being pro-genocide, which is a conclusion that you could work your way to if you really want to, but, uh, you know, but you really do have to kind of close yourself off to the possibility that maybe this terminology and this ideology, which is not yours is also not yours to define. That seems to be a bit of significant part of the problem. And so they're interested in, as a part of their formal demands for divestment, the banning of Hillel organizations from campus, which you should be aware, if you're actually trying to come to some sort of negotiated settlement with the university, will be viewed, is being viewed, by the Jewish community on campus. Why do they view it as anti-Semitic? Because... To them, Hillel is a place where you would go to get potato latkes uh, at uh, Hanukkah and some candles and maybe a dreidel. And what's wrong with you? How could you possibly ban that? That's like asking the campus uh, to prohibit the distribution of um, uh, of sp well, as as many campuses now make this allowance of being able to pick up a to-go meal from the dining hall during Ramadan so that you can eat uh, after sundown during Ramadan, though the dining hall is closed, making accommodations for things like that, or making available a space in, on campus in the gym or wherever else for prayers for Muslim students during Ramadan, if there's no mosque nearby or something like that, and saying, we're going to ban that practice because, after all, it inures to the benefit of whoever, right? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a problematic demand, even though it's not seen as problematic very often by the people making it. Anyway, so like I was saying, I, this all needed to be put on the record because this is going to be a very contentious demand and there's going to be students uh in among the protesters who say no we have not settled with the administration because the administration has not divested and the administration will return by saying we've sold all our positions in any comp any corporation that is either incorporated in israel or has a significant business component in israel we've gone that far uh but your definition of divestment is boot off campus and de-charter uh, any organization that represents Jewish student life on campus, and that's too far for us. 
And they'll say, well, then we just don't see eye to eye and the encampment begins. We'll see whether they have enough support among their fellow students to actually populate a a uh, encampment like that at the, in the same numbers that they did the first time around. So all of that in the background, there is the statement from UCLA's Hillel organization where they had, uh, UCLA, of course, is where they had the violence from uh, some from students, some from it is said here, outside agitators as well. But when it comes to violence, we don't really care who did it so much, just that it ought to stop. And whoever you are, you should be held accountable for it. Interesting statement from UCLA's Hillel. And it's a, uh, it, it, it is conveyed over two screenshots here. We might as well read the whole thing, though there's a pull quote from it. It's just interesting. So the UCLA Jewish student leaders Ask to non-campus Jews. That's how it's titled here. That is, in other words, we're asking members of the Jewish community of Los Angeles who thought they were somehow doing the right thing by coming and fighting with the protesters. On Tuesday evening, when we heard explosions at the UCLA encampment, Hillel student leaders together ran to campus. Tensions at UCLA have never been higher, and the encampment has attracted tremendous off-campus attention from media and activists. There is a palpable, palpable feeling that we are just one unfortunate incident away from tragedy. And they were pretty much right at the line of tragedy that day. So, yeah, the Jewish community is our entire world. The way they put it, our collective years of serving on Hillel boards, uh, attending pro-Israel conferences. Yes, that's part of the activity of Hillel. And years of Hebrew school have given us a strong dedication to Jewish advocacy. But we ran to campus to encourage restraint. We needed to warn the fringe members of the off-campus Jewish community that storming the peaceful encampment was endangering the Jewish students they were ostensibly attempting to protect, not to mention the fact that there were probably some of them inside the encampment, but they were angry at them. So to in their minds, well, I'm angry at those people, so obviously I can whack them over the head and fire, you know, throw fireworks at them. Over the course of the night, we watched a petty fight over a plywood barricade draw shocking amounts of blood from protesters' heads. Fireworks were shot into the crowded encampment, burning and traumatizing students. Bird scooters, which for those of you not uh, currently on campus, it's a brand of rentable scooters. Uh, it's not like little scooters for birds, like little mm, the parrots that could ride the scooters across the high wire at uh, Parrot Jungle in Florida back in the day. But bird scooters, they're big, they're heavy. They hurt. Heavy speakers, traffic cones, and water bottles flew back and forth over the plywood wall. Pepper spray, bear spray, and tear gas were sprayed. Innocent writers from the Daily Bruin, the newspaper, got chased and beaten to the ground by an angry mob of 30 Jewish men. And they're clear about who it was. The truth is that a largely peaceful pro-Palestinian encampment was attacked by an angry, violent mob comprised of fringe members of the off-campus Jewish community last night. They do not represent the estimated 3,000 Jewish Bruins at UCLA, yet those are precisely the people who will have to live with the reverberations of their aggressive actions. We cannot have a clearer ask for the off-campus Jewish community. Stay off our campus. Do not fund any actions on campus. Do not protest on campus. Your actions are harming Jewish students. Not only, I would say, the Jewish students you think you're protecting uh, in, in their right to counter protest, but also the Jewish students who are inside as part of the protest. Also the Jewish students who have nothing whatsoever to do with any of this somehow and just want to live their lives peacefully, and go on with the semester. We are not excusing the horrifying anti-Semitism exhibited by protesters uh, where they view that it is happening, nor are we excusing the chancellors, administrators, and LAPDs in action. 
That's a good point, too. We are simply a Jewish Zionist identifying students, we are students, who live on campus and don't get to leave when the protest is over. It is our friends on the other side of the barricade who, in this moment, we disagree with but respect as fellow students that are physically hurt. What the non-campus community members can do right now is support Jewish students by enriching our Jewish lives. The rest of it, I think, a little bit more of like summary, but the important parts have been on the record. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the k grow in the morning show here on at roots radio uh okay on another note although i do i well, i think i will and uh, i do intend to return to this note believe it or not yet more about this i don't know it's complicated we might as well vent about it but Scott informs me that there's development from uh, Sleepy Time Nap Corner courtroom in New York where uh, there is word from Judge, or there was word before, and there still is, we just didn't get to it immediately, from Judge Merchon that uh, on the question of whether or not Donald Trump will once again be found guilty of violating his gag order and what will it mean? And the answer is more of the same. So it turns out NBC News reporting here, judge finds Trump further violated gag order and again threatens him with jail if necessary. And I mean, it's beginning to sound like it is necessary and that uh, the upshot of that will be we will be hearing much, much more about how it could happen if necessary. I guess that's really going to be about it for now. Uh, let's see. Ginger Gibson, Adam Rice, Jillian Frankel and Gary Grumbach are the team I guess at the courtroom for NBC, or at least the team writing about what's happening at the courtroom for NBC. Uh, on Monday, the judge again cited, Monday is today, of course, right now, cited former President Donald Trump for violating the gag order he imposed on the trial and warned he could face jail, quote, if necessary, for continuing to ignore it. Merchant previously found that Trump had violated the gag order in nine other instances, nine times. Nine times. And then did some more. So, you know, if necessary, there's jail. So nine times, find him $9,000 for it. In issuing that decision, Merchon warned that if Trump, conti- oh, uh, warned Trump that continued violations of the order could result as in, a, in his incarceration, a threat he made again today after finding him the maximum of $1,000 for the most recent violation. It appears that the $1,000 fines are not serving as a deterrent, Merchan said. The last thing I want to do is put you in jail, he added. You are the former president of the United States and possibly the next president as well. There are many reasons why incarceration is truly a last resort for you, he continued, adding that taking that step would be disruptive to the proceedings. But Merchon warned Trump that his continued willful violations of the court's orders threaten the administration of justice and continue a direct attack on the rule of law. I cannot allow that to continue unless I do. 
Merchan also said that if the offending statement had been posted to Trump's Truth Social account or his official campaign website, it must be removed by 2.15 p.m. Or else then he's really going to get grumpy about it, I guess. The order prohibits Trump from discussing the jury or witnesses with the intent to influence their decisions or testimony. This judge has taken away my constitutional right, Trump said in the hallway on Friday morning. We're filing, I think today, a constitutional motion. Okay, whatever. Uh, He added, if somebody says something about me and I'm not allowed to respond, that's never happened before. And of course, it really doesn't matter unless that person is a witness in the case or a juror or a relative of one of the officers of the court. So, you know, he keeps going around claiming that if anybody says anything about it, I'm not allowed to say anything. That's garbage. That's what's so wrong with this thing. And it's just not actually true about the gag order. Anyway, Trump has repeatedly complained about Michael Cohen, his former lawyer, who's expected to testify for the prosecution. Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, argued in court on Thursday that Cohen's statements about Trump mean the former president should be able to respond. He also argued that as a presidential candidate, Trump should be able to defend himself, pointing to a remark by President Joe Biden that appears to allude to the case. And again, yeah, so what? The criticism of Joe Biden isn't precluded by the gag order. He's not a potential witness in this case, and he's not a juror. You can criticize Joe Biden all you want, but this is Trump's way of saying, this is what's so illegal and so unconstitutional about this uh, gag order, this so-called gag order. It won't let me campaign against Joe Biden. It will. It will. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the campaign. So anyway, now that that's clear and uh, we're once again being told, uh, if you do this even one more time, we're totally definitely going to maybe kind of sort of put you in jail. But to be fair, these additional, I guess the uh, additional violations happened before the issuance of the threat that will put you in jail if necessary. But also the threat was always like, well, probably just not going to put him in jail. So forget about it. Uh, I would have to get pretty egregious, I think, for Judge Merchant to consider that. We're just going to have a lot more warnings, I think, is what's most likely. Okay, now back to some of the other things that I had in mind for you to share, uh, including yet more on all of those protests, because, you know, that's kind of an important thing. I, I have something that I thought I might share with you that's kind of a long read, but I guess maybe before we'll do that, I'll give you one highlight one good piece of information, I guess, for those of you who are, um, I don't know, uh, who are following along and saying, well, I I understand all of this nuance, et cetera, et cetera. But when are we going to start seeing something uh, happening on the uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy front that's going to make a real difference with Israel? Maybe this is happening I don't know. Maybe this. Maybe there's a bit of a turning point here. Axios has a scoop, and we'll see whether it holds up and whether it turns out to be true. Uh, the U.S. has put a hold on an ammunition shipment to Israel, and I think this is for the first time in the space of this conflict that that has happened. So, you know, that's something that people have been calling for for a long time and thought was among the most obvious approaches, if not actual necessarily solutions to the issue, uh, but something that we ought to be exercising the right to do as a good faith effort towards uh, curtailing the worst, perhaps, of this war. The Biden administration last week put a hold on a shipment of U.S.-made ammunition to Israel, to Israeli officials told Axios. By the way, I have not yet called out the author of the piece, Barak Ravid. So, I don't know, sounds sounds Israeli. Is he Israeli? Barak Ravid, I should take a look. Is there a link to his bio? Um, just would give us some idea of what's going on. A re- political reporter and Middle East expert for Axios covering foreign policy in the 2024 election. Um, also writes for Wala News in Israel and is the author of Trump's Peace. <laughs> and it's not about Stormy Daniels. P-E-A-C-E. What's wrong with you people? Anyway, Barack, the other Barack, continues uh, in Axios style. 
I don't know whether he submits these pieces in Axios style or the editors hammer it into shape, but there's the why it matters section. Why would it matter that the United States has halted a shipment of ammunition to Israel? Can you imagine why it might matter? Well, it's the first time since the October 7th attacks that the U.S. has stopped a weapons shipment intended for the Israeli military. So there you have it. You've been waiting for that. There it is. Uh, And reaction over the weekend, of course, was mixed in range from, well, of course, bad because, I, you know, uh, someone who says it is, I'm pro-Israel and I want them to have more ammunition, even though I know very well. In fact, because I know very well how they're using their ammunition. There are such people. Uh, By the same token, there are also people who say, good, because it's about time. And there are even people on the other end, the horseshoe had bad because it's not enough or how come it took you so long or what's wrong with you or you're going to end up releasing the shipment of ammunition anyway or maybe you've met my expectations again on yet another issue that I was used to criticizing the Biden administration for not meeting and now I have to think of something else to criticize you about. There's a little bit of that going on out there too. Anyway, why does it matter? Well, okay, we'll take you through it. The incident raised serious concerns inside the Israeli government. That's a good thing. And sent officials scrambling to understand why the shipment was held, Israeli officials said. And if you haven't figured that out yet, come on. And also, President Biden is facing sharp criticism among Americans who oppose his support of Israel. The administration in February asked Israel to provide assurances that U.S.-made weapons were being used by the Israel Defense Forces in Gaza in accordance with international law. I mean, that's a pretty low bar to ask for, right? Israel provided a signed letter of assurances in March. And I mean, this is the procedural approach to something like this. The procedural approach to uh, potential slash actual demonstrated, depending on where you fall on all this, genocide. Okay, Uh well, yes, I've heard you, and you know, in order, one of the things you have to do in order to uh, reach that conclusion, well, you could just jump to that conclusion. Many people do. You go to the International Criminal Court, and you make a case, and then you, you know, will have unassailable proof that you can call it this. In the meantime, procedurally with the U.S., well, why don't you stop the weapons? Well, um, let's try this. We'll continue the shipments because of international geopolitics. But please assure us that you're not using our weapons to violate international law, the lowest possible bar. Well, all right, we'll sign it. And of course, everybody rolls their eyes at that and says, well, that's nothing because then there'll be mountains of proof that they, but those people will still be dead when you, even if you finally get the proof you need to stop the shipments. What about the people who were killed in the meantime? Yes. Well, that's the procedural approach to things. And now finally, you have this situation where people say, eh, they told us they pro- they we asked them to clear the lowest bar and i think that they haven't cleared that bar we really at some point have just got to stop even if it's just temporary stop the shipment to get their attention well it's finally happened will it play out the way everyone wants no never does it can't possibly because there's too many opinions out there but the state of play tells us that the Israeli officials said that the ammunition shipment to Israel was stopped last week. The White House has declined to comment on it so far, at least up until uh, when I logged this report and put it in um, uh, pocket. The Pentagon, the State Department, and the Israeli Prime Minister's Office didn't immediately respond to questions about it. We'll see whether there's any more news about it now. We can go take a look in the the news. Uh, Whoops. All right, let's see. And we'll, uh, what are we looking for? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, arms shipment, maybe, to uh, Israel and see if there's any uh, update on it in the news. Uh, no, I think the most recent thing we have is this scoop from Axios and uh, nothing more, no updates on it. So anyway, we'll, we'll finish out the rest of this brief report. The Pentagon, State Department, as we said, Israeli Prime Minister's Office, no comments since then. Driving the news, the Biden administration is highly concerned that Israel will invade the southern Gaza city of Rafah. That's the last uh, holdout 
there, of course, where they evacuated the entire north of Gaza City itself and told civilians to flee southward if they wanted to stay out of the way of the fighting. And then, of course, the fighting has made its way to Rafah as well. And when we say the fighting, we mean both Israeli uh, uh, operations there, not a full-scale invasion of Rafah yet, but apparently they keep threatening it. But in addition, because Hamas is who Hamas is, and we should really recognize that, they have made a point of launching rockets into Israel from the refugee camps in Rafah in an effort, more than likely. Uh, what else would it be about? It would be about uh, provoking an Israeli response, which Hamas can then point to and say, see how cruel, because these are refugees. Except you shouldn't be launching rockets from among the refugees because you know very well what kind of response it's going to provoke. And yet you do it anyway for political points. And that's one of the big problems and why no one can see eye to eye about any of this. So uh, where were we with this? Yes, uh, driving the news, the Biden administration has been highly concerned about a possible operation in Rafah where more than one million displaced Palestinians have been taking shelter. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released several statements in recent days saying he intended to order an invasion of Rafah regardless of whether Israel and Hamas reach a deal for the release of hostages being held in Gaza and whether they re, uh, uh, even, I guess, is he saying, it says, and a ceasefire. Let me read through it. So Netanyahu uh, intended to order an invasion regardless of whether Israel and Hamas reach a deal for the release of hostages and a ceasefire. So I don't know how you do that, right? If you reach a deal for a ceasefire and then you launch operations in Rafah, then there's not a ceasefire. You violated the terms of that ceasefire. So I don't know, but none of this has made any sense from the beginning. Netanyahu hinted at tensions with the Biden administration in a statement on Holocaust Remembrance Day issued on Sunday. And of course, well... hmm. Uh, unattractively using it as a cudgel here. In the terrible Holocaust, there were great world leaders who stood by idly. Therefore, the first lesson of the Holocaust, he says, is if we do not defend ourselves, nobody will defend us. And if we need to stand alone, we will stand alone, he said. Except that, you know, you can't stand alone. You need our ammunition to stand. Behind the scenes, last Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, Anthony Blinken, visited Israel and had a tough it says here, conversation with Netanyahu regarding a possible Israeli operation in Rafah. Two sources briefed on the meeting said, Blinken told Netanyahu during their meeting that a major military operation in Rafah would lead to the U.S. publicly opposing it and would negatively impact U.S.-Israel relations. What that leaves room for, of course, is the definition of what is a major military operation. A day later, the white, I mean, does it matter to you if you're killed in a minor one? Not to you, it doesn't. A day later, White House spokesman John Kirby told reporters that Israeli leaders understand that President Biden is sincere when he talks about the possibility of changes to U.S. policy regarding a Gaza war should they move ahead with some sort of ground operations in Rafah that doesn't take into account the refugees. Again, plenty of definitional room there. The White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said at a Financial Times conference in Washington on Saturday that the Biden administration made clear to Israel that the way it will conduct an operation in Rafah will influence U.S. policy towards the Gaza war. The big picture, Egyptian and Qatari mediators are still trying to reach a hostage deal between Israel and Hamas that would lead to a pause in the fighting in Gaza. The Biden administration is deeply involved in the efforts and CIA director Bill Burns joined the talks in Cairo over the weekend. Hamas, in a statement on Friday, said that it was reviewing the current proposal with positive spirit, whatever that means, and was, quote, going to Cairo in the same spirit to reach an agreement. While Israel waits for Hamas's response to the proposal, Netanyahu has issued several statements over the weekend saying he won't agree to end the war as part of a hostage deal. Hmm. Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant uh, visited Israeli military forces in Gaza on Saturday and said Israel sees worrying signals that Hamas isn't going to move forward on an agreement to release hostages. This means that an operation in Rafah and other parts of Gaza will take place in the very near future, Gallant said. So... 
We wait and see. That's the international context here. I wanted to double back, though, since we spent so much time already. We might as well burn more time talking about Hillel. And I mentioned to you that there's been a change in the official uh, ethos around which, I guess, Hillel organizes in the recent years. And so many of you who might be about my age or perhaps a little bit younger who have had some experience with Hillel, either as Jewish students, uh, I can tell you this, as a Jewish student in my student days, my involvement with Hillel was absolutely zero, just nothing. I never had anything to do with it. I just didn't. I just wasn't interested in, in it, but it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with uh, politics or Zionism. It was just, uh, you know, at uh, age 18, you're not that far removed from your formal Jewish education, which as a formal uh, Jewish student of age, you know, f- let's say 12 through 16 or so, you can't wait to get away from it in many cases. I assume some people are like, can't get enough of it. Got to go become a rabbi, but not most. And anyway, Hillel, it existed. I knew that it existed. Didn't know where it existed. I could have looked up the address of the Hillel house. I just didn't have reason to go. I wasn't in a place that had a very big Jewish community. And I wasn't all that far from home anyway, so it didn't feel like I was isolated otherwise. But... Uh, so if you are of about the same age, you probably have the same view of Hillel. It was there. If you wanted to pick up a menorah or get some potato latkes and you just couldn't stand to wait until you got home, you could go get it. But other than that, it wasn't in your face. Has it changed of late? Foreign Policy magazine says yes in the person of Batya Ungar Sargon, who writes this piece, how the Israel lobby captured Hillel. Uh, So, well, all right. Let's see what she has to say and see if we can't run through the bulk of the article here. Uh, So how it captured Hillel, the Hillel International. And remember, uh, there are individual Hillel chapters on each of these campuses, but I guess ostensibly they are all governed by Hillel International Uh, And the governance, their right to govern their activities is recognized to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the campus leadership of Hillel. Hillel International used to be a welcoming campus organization for Jews of all persuasions. They say, though, not anymore. Let's see what it's about. Joshua Wolfson, a senior at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, never expected his college education to include a threat of a lawsuit. And he definitely didn't expect it to include one from Hillel International. Hmm. My sense going into college was that Hillel was a center for Jewish campus life, Wolfson told me, of the organization that oversees a network of Jewish campus centers across the United States and abroad. Wolfson joined the Swarthmore branch of Hillel during his freshman year, and served on its board for three years. He resigned recently to focus on job applications and senior year wrap-up things, but remains involved in the organization. I expected it to be a pluralistic, open, inclusive space to explore Jewish identities and learn and grow. And that's from a very involved student, right? But still sees it that way. And from students who were not involved, even though I wasn't involved in Hillel, I mean, again, my sense of it was, even if it wasn't a place I was going to go to pick up uh, Hanukkah candles, it was a place where you could reliably turn if for some reason, as frequently happened back in those days, you found yourself with uh, the university uh, holding, I don't know whether it would ever hold final exams at this time, But uh, no, it wouldn't. But uh, holding exams or something or some important mandatory type function on, you know, important Jewish holidays, Uh, high holy days, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, when even uh, only loosely practicing Jews might feel obligated to find themselves at services. Uh, And, uh, you know, for many years right up really through years where I attended college. It was just one of those things. Administrators would have had no idea because it wasn't on the calendars that you buy at your Hallmark or at the local grocery store. It wouldn't tell you 
when the Jewish holy days were, and even if they did, you wouldn't recognize what they were, and you might schedule something important for those dates. And Hillel would be there and would speak up and say, you know, some significant percentage of the students here aren't going to be able to attend or won't will feel compelled to attend despite the fact that they would rather be taking care of religious uh, obligations. And for that, it was good. And to find years later that uh, one of the demands of the protest is that that come to an end seems incongruous. That's the point of telling you all of this. But because there's always nuance somewhere, we're going to read through this and find out why it might have come to make sense to some of the protesters. I guess. And, and that would include perhaps some of the Jewish protesters as well. But Joshua Wolfson, of course, doesn't think anymore that uh, Hillel is always going to be a pluralistic, open, inclusive space to explore Jewish identities. Because in 2010, Hillel International, the parent organization of Campus Hillels, developed an explicit policy officially named the Standards of Partnership that prohibits hosting or co-partnering with individuals or organizations deemed anti-Israel or in support of a the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, or BDS, regime. Right? Wolfson and his colleagues at Swarthmore wanted to host a wider range of events and speakers than Hillel's guidelines allow. And in December of 2013, they declared their Hillel open, in rejection of Hillel International's restrictions. This sometimes happens. In January of 2015, the Swarthmore students began organizing an event featuring civil rights activists now involved in Palestinian solidarity activism who support BDS. When Hillel International got wind of the program, the organization insisted that the program not proceed under its name. Liliana Rodriguez, then an associate dean at Swarthmore College, received a letter from Hillel's lawyer that threatened legal action against the college if the program went ahead as planned. They know the pressure point. If the students or speakers intend for this program to be a discussion in which the speakers present or proselytize their known anti-Israel and pro-BDS agenda, this would cross the clear line for programs that violate Hillel International's standards of partnership and could be reason for Hillel International to seek to protect its guidelines, name, and reputation, Hillel's lawyer wrote. In response to Hillel International's legal threats, Swarthmore's Hillel Group changed its name and proceeded to hold the event. Kids know the rules, right? Because the group there is independently funded by Swarthmore's Student Activities Fund, and through an endowment raised by Swarthmore's Jewish organization over the years, no financial risk was at stake. The group's funds continued to be managed by Hillel of Greater Philadelphia. Got to pause here for just a second to point out why this, you know, what the relation is between here and what we read from the UCLA group and what we hear about the demands for uh, divestment to include banning Hillel from campus. In some cases, right? Uh, where uh, the groups, the local groups have decided to continue to abide by the Hillel International Directive about these things, you could plausibly claim that, well, this is a part of the movement to declare any discussion of Palestinian rights to be somehow anti-Israel and therefore anti-Semitic. And on top of which... Uh, if you have a situation like you do at Swarthmore, where it's Swarthmore, uh, this, it's ironic. The students were free to break with Hillel International because part of the funding of the organization comes from student activities funds. But it is exactly that independence that comes from funding them with student activity funds that is uh, targeted by the protesters. This should be cut off because that's an explicit university endorsement of anti-Palestinian bias. Though, as it turns out, in this case, the funds were used to make room for Palestinian protest and uh, demands for civil rights and, and an approach which would educate the Swarthmore Jewish community to the necessity of bringing... Palestinian civil rights into the modern era. So interesting 
this interplay. And then, of course, the interplay of, well, we demand, or some people somewhere demand, that uh, Hillel be kicked off campus. And yet, even at the campuses where the reaction to the protest has been the most violent, it's been Hillel that's jumped out to say this has to stop. And yet, among the demands, are they among the demands in UCLA, in the UCLA encampment, that Hillel be banned from activity on campus? And are they, uh, do they have a, a leg to stand on? Are student activity funds being used to fund Hillel? And I'm sure that it's got to be galling, of course, right, for Palestinian students who pay the same activity funds to see that that money is going to Hillel when on the Hillel International, anyway, Hillel International website, it says they're a pro-Zionist organization. And of course, depending on what your understanding of Zionist or pro-Zionist organization is, that could be more than galling. On the other hand, I hope it's at least some relief that it turns out that the Jewish students on campus who are most involved at the local level with the Hillel chapter there say differently. But this is an interesting thing, an interesting article. You should probably read all the way through it if you feel compelled to find out more about the history uh, and evolution of Hillel from that just sort of nice hangout space where Jewish students can go if they're just feeling isolated and into turning into, like everything else, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, various other uh, Jewish organizations that have just become, for whatever reason, implicitly or not, affiliated with difficult to defend positions over the years. Interesting aspect of NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to K Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. I know you probably want to get free from this subject, but it is uh, important and uh, going to be a key part of the election. But there's much more to discuss, of course, and Justice Putnam is just the guy to do it with the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up next right here on Netroots Radio with the usual assortment of stories from around the country and around the world. Stay tuned.